Shana Tova. Some of you might remember that back in the day, movies started at a particular time, and if you wanted to catch the movie, you needed to be there when it started. If the movie started at 7 p.m., you needed to be there at 7 p.m. to get the full story. Otherwise, you'd be baffled about why the strong man in the cape was so afraid of that little green glowing rock. It seems that right now we are at the beginning of the high holiday season, but actually, as Rabbi Alan Liu points out in his majestic work, this is real and you are completely unprepared. We are already in the second act of this great spiritual drama, a play which has five acts, Tisha B'Av, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Sukkot, and Simchas Torah. This is a play about how we tell the stories of our lives and how we can change the stories and our lives. The arc of this play goes through five pieces. Act one, Tisha B'Av, when dreams crumble. Act two, Rosh Hashanah, where we are right now, casting off stale narratives. Act three, Yom Kippur, when we are stripped to essentials. Act four, Sukkot, we begin to build again. And finally, act five, when we rejoice in the truth. The beginning of this season was actually seven weeks ago on the ninth of the Hebrew month of Av. Tisha B'Av is the day of total disaster on the Jewish calendar. For all of Jewish history, the ninth of Av has been a day of catastrophe and destruction. By traditional reckoning, it's the day that the Holocaust began, and it's also the day we were expelled from Spain in the Middle Ages. The earliest catastrophe, though, is the betrayal of the scouts in the Torah. In the book of Numbers, we hear from the omniscient, anonymous narrator of the Torah about these scouts for the first time. In Deuteronomy, we hear about them for the second time from the perspective of Moses. In the first telling, in the book of Numbers, Moses sends these scouts into the land of Israel to see if it was an appropriate home for the Israelites who had just left Egypt. The scouts came back and said, look, the place is fortified, the people are giants. We know that God promised to us, but there is no way we can take it. We need a different plan. The people panicked, complaining that Moses had only taken them out of Egypt to die in the wilderness. In the biblical telling, it was a result of the scouts' betrayal that the Holy One condemned the Israelites to wander in the desert for 40 years and condemned virtually the entire generation who heard that report to die in the desert. Only Joshua and Caleb, who were confident in God's promise, were able to enter the land. Now, remember those scouts. We're going to come back to them. The betrayal of the scouts, though, is not the only or even the most important catastrophe of Tisha B'Av. It's also the day when the first temple in Jerusalem was destroyed, and it's the day when the second temple was destroyed. It is the worst. Traditionally, we literally sit in ashes and sackcloth and mourn the destruction of the temple in the year 72 of the Common Era. This is a building that stood for 580 years, and has been mourned for nearly four times as long. The temple has had a far longer career as an idea than it ever did as a building. When we mourn, we mourn the loss of an idea more than anything else. Alice and I have a close friend who married late, and when we saw her over the summer, she was so, so excited to tell us that she was expecting her first child. Tragically, the baby was stillborn just a few weeks ago. Our friend was, of course, absolutely devastated. It's not just that the baby was stillborn, she said. I'm 43 years old. I don't know if I get another chance to be a mother. Sometimes the death of an idea, a dream, is the most painful death of all. That's what Act One what Tisha B'Av is all about. The death of the dream of the temple and the death of so many dreams. The family that was supposed to be, the career that was supposed to be. Tisha B'Av is the day we mourn our dreams that have died, both personal and national. Today, of course, we find ourselves in act two.
Rosh Hashanah. It is, of course, the start of the new year, and later on this afternoon of the second day, we'll arrive at Tashlich, one of the most important and certainly one of the most beautiful parts of this play. We'll gather at Long Dock and cast off stale bread to symbolize the stale narratives that we need to get rid of. Now, without narratives, without stories we tell about the experiences we have, we'd be amnesiacs living in an endless parade of meaningless, disjointed experiences. We cannot live without narratives, and yet we cannot grow if we cling to old narratives, stale narratives, if we hold on to those stories more tightly than we hold fast to what is real now. I used to live in North Carolina, and the very first time we went down to visit, we asked an old man for directions to the newspaper where I was interviewing to be a journalist. You take this road down to where the Wendy's used to be and then take a left. He said, I've never been here before. I said, I don't know where the Wendy's used to be. Well, go to where it used to be. And there's a field with some trees. Take a left there. Despite his directions, I did make it to the newspaper. Often we get lost and feel so much pain because of narratives we hold onto long past their expiration date. Rosh Hashanah is a chance to release those narratives, to stop navigating our lives by the Wendy's that used to be there. We can't live without narrative. It's how we make sense of our experiences. But so often our narratives outlive the facts. So today Rosh Hashanah is here so we can cast off those old stories and begin to tell new ones. During the Torah reading this morning, we heard about Hagar, the woman with whom Abraham has his first son, Ishmael. Sarah, his wife, couldn't bear children, and so she urged Abraham to have a child with her servant, Hagar. Bo na al shifchatai, ulai ibane mimena. Lie with my servant, Sarah said, and perhaps I will have a child by way of her. But once the child was born, everything changed. Sarah didn't see the child as hers and treated Hagar harshly. Hagar ran away from Sarah's cruelty and returned only at the explicit command of God. It's easy to imagine her, Hagar, feeling like a junkyard dog, used for her body and then hated for it. Eventually, Sarah did have a child. Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age. Soon after that son Isaac is born, Sarah demands that Hagar and Ishmael leave their camp. So Sarah sends them, uh, so Abraham sends them out into the wilderness of Beersheba with some bread and water. The water, of course, doesn't last long in the desert. And when it runs out, Hagar goes to hide because she doesn't want to see her child die of thirst. Now, Hagar was a servant who was cast out into the wilderness by the father of her child, by her master, Abraham. In the paintings of that scene, Hagar is usually shown as despondent. And why shouldn't she be? Her life so far had been a series of punishment and rejections, and it was hard for her to see how that might change. Horrible things, it seemed, always happened to her. And this time, no doubt, was more of the same. So confident was she that the end was at hand, and so petrified was she that her son was going to die of thirst, she turned away saying, let me not look on as the child dies. But at the moment when Ishmael's death seems certain, a miracle occurs and there is water for him. But the miracle is not that the water suddenly sprung out of the ground. The miracle, as the Torah tells it, God opened her eyes and Hagar saw the water that had been there all along. Her reality didn't change, but the way she experienced it did. She had become a prisoner of her own story, her own narrative of pain and suffering, such that she could not see when circumstances changed. Hagar's problem it seems, was not a lack of water, but a lack of vision. 
We tell stories about ourselves and each other. These stories don't simply describe what we see, they define what we see. When we lived in North Carolina, after I made my way to the newspaper, the Durham Herald Sun, and got my first job as a reporter there, I had an incredibly lousy car. It needed constant work, which meant I got to know my mechanic, Ronnie, really well. He taught me to drive a standard, and he taught me how to change a muffler on a car, which is actually not really that hard. In his younger years, Ronnie had been a jet engine mechanic in the Navy, and when he retired from the Navy, he opened this auto garage. Sometimes later, though, he had an accident and was confined to this wheelchair. He was incredibly sanguine about the turns that his life had taken. I used to be a mechanic, but that part of things is over, he said, and that sucks. I like being a mechanic, but now I'm a businessman. New chapter. Acknowledging pain and mourning, that's what Tisha B'Av is for. Rosh Hashanah, now, is about letting go of those things that we mourn. In The Tempest, Antonio says, what's past is prologue, what to come in your hand and mine to discharge. In order to act, we must let the past be prologue and recognize that now and only now is the arena in which we can act. Today, on Rosh Hashanah, we cast away stale narratives. Next week, on Yom Kippur, we get stripped down to absolutely nothing. On Yom Kippur, we shed everything. We don't eat, we don't drink, we don't fornicate, we don't spend money. We don't avail ourselves of any of the mechanisms we have to distract ourselves from our own heart. We sit facing a relentless onslaught of liturgy that if we let it, can scrape away our illusions and delusions. Yom Kippur has the aura of death around it. From the very first notes of Kol Nidre, we hear the pain of loss, the pain of impermanence. This is the essential hurdle we have to contend with as we make our way in this world. Everything passes, everyone dies. The people we love, the things we love, the world around us, our parents, our children, our grandchildren, our spouse, our strength, the Hudson Highlands and the New York skyline are all sliding away, even as they are being built. We know that everything is temporary, and so we try to hold on as tightly as we can. We try to hold on to our strength and our youth and each other. Yom Kippur is the day to relax our grip and stop trying to hold back the waves of the ocean. COVID these past 18 months has changed everything and nothing. As painful and gut-wrenching and unnecessary as all of this has been, it has always been the case that we will pass away, that our loved ones are mortal, that our community and our country and our government will one day pass on. In light of that, how do we live? Yom Kippur is the day on which we are stripped down to the very elemental aspects of our existence, including the fact that we are temporary. At the end of that day, we arrive at the breakfast, physically and spiritually spent, and from there, we are ready for Act 4, Sukkot. Now, Sukkot is when things start to turn around. It's when new life sprouts from the scorched earth. Traditionally, we end Yom Kippur by beginning to erect our sukkah because while Yom Kippur is in many ways a day of death, Sukkot is where life begins to flourish. Where Tisha B'Av mourns the destruction of a beautiful, perfect, elaborate temple that none of us have ever seen, Sukkot begins with the construction of a rickety hut, unstable and open to the sky. Sukkot is that moment of simplicity before we start spinning the tales that both give our lives meaning and entrap us. I want to jump back to those scouts. You remember from the beginning? When we read the story in the book of Numbers, it seems like it's the scouts who sinned, doubting God, sowing dissent, and generally wreaking havoc by telling the Israelites that they couldn't live in the land of Israel. But years later, 
when a new generation is preparing to enter the land of Israel, Moses tells them the story of the scouts in a very different way. This time, it's not the scouts, but the people, the Israelites, who are to blame. As Rabbi Alan Liu points out, they are no longer innocents misled into disobedience. Rather, as Moses tells the story, the scouts, the scouts said, it is a good land that God is giving us. Pack your bags, let's go. And as Moses continues the story, he chastises this new generation who had not even been born at the time of the incident of the scouts and says, you refuse to go. You flouted the command of the Lord and instead you sulked in your tents. What's up? Why does Moses blame the people when the first version of the story, the contemporaneous version of the story, seems to blame the scouts? Moses put the blame on the people, the people he is addressing, because those are the only people that matter. Moses isn't a historian and he isn't talking about the past. He's talking about the future. This new generation is getting ready to enter the land and there will inevitably be friction, if not conflict, as there is in all of our relationships. Spiritually speaking, the only question worth asking about any conflict is this. What is my responsibility for it? What did I contribute to this? And what can I do that might prevent it from happening again? When things go wrong, there's enormous temptation to focus on things external to us, on the evil of others or in an unlucky turn of events. Other people do horrible things. There are, we are, all real victims in this world, even as there are also real perpetrators. And yet, the Torah demands that we resist this temptation, no matter how strong it may be, and no matter how strongly rooted in fact or history it may be. The only place we can ever affect change is here, with us, not there, with them. There's a woman I know who's gone through two failed marriages and is in perpetual conflict with her grown sons. She says that she wants things to be different, but there's just nothing she can do. Why? Because her husbands were terrible people and her children are ingrates. Now, it could very well be true that her two husbands were terrible people and her children are ingrates. It also doesn't matter. She lives alone and will quite likely die alone. And even if all of those people are as bad as she imagines them to be, she gets no points for being right. In difficult moments, we are spiritually called to take responsibility and ask, what am I doing to make this recur again and again? Even with conflict that was clearly thrust upon us, how are we plunging into it? What is there in us that needs to be engaged in this conflict? What prevents us from letting it roll off our backs? We don't need to focus on our actions because they are the most important part of the dynamic, although sometimes they are. We need to focus on our actions because they are the only thing under our control. Everyone here, everyone in this room, everyone listening to this is immensely powerful beyond our wildest dreams, but only in a very narrowly defined arena. It is only here and now, in this moment, in the present, that we can act. We can't act in the past, we can't act in the future, and we can't act for someone else. Only us, only here and now. We often squander our ability to act in the present because we're lamenting our inability to act in the past. That's what Moses was trying to make clear to the people about to enter the land. Things will happen. Scouts will give bad reports. Enemies will attack. Famine will unfold. Our parents will disappoint us. Our children will annoy us. Our friends will betray us and our bodies will fail us. Our power in its grandeur and in its limits is entirely in how we react. A few years ago, when Allison was seriously ill, I put on a great deal of weight. At one point, I weighed nearly 300 pounds. 
And I had good reason. I was immensely stressed. I didn't have time to cook healthy meals or exercise. And loving friends and congregants brought healthy, brought delicious, but maybe not so healthy lasagnas, which I kept eating, often at four o'clock in the morning. I had good reason for what I was doing. It was true, but it didn't matter. It was irrelevant because while all of those are good and legitimate justifications for how I treated my body, I didn't want to have a well-justified heart attack by the time I was 50 years old. My heart wasn't going to say, oh, you know, Brent had a good reason for treating his body the way he did, so we won't seize up on him. Our friend with the terrible husbands and the ingrate sons might be entirely accurate in her analysis. It also doesn't matter. If she wants a different outcome, she needs to assess what she can do in the here and now. This is what Sukkot comes to teach. There is only this moment. This is the only place where we have power. This is the only place the divine is present. We can be as open to this moment as a sukkah is to the sky, or we can let this moment pass while we think about what could have been and should have been. From there, we come to the final act of our play, Simchas Torah, rejoicing in the truth. Sukkah is in many ways the anti-temple. A sukkah is not grand and it will not last forever. In fact, most of them, certainly mine, barely make it through a week-long holiday. A sukkah exists for a moment and then it vanishes. So do our lives. We begin perhaps with grand temple-esque dreams. I'll make a million dollars by the time I'm 25. I will have the love of my life and will be happily married forever. Things will be perfect in this way and that. Over the course of these first few holidays, the first few acts of this play, we scrape away those stories until we are left with nothing. Then, from there, we rebuild sukkah-esque dreams, which highlight what is more than set aspirations for what might be. Sukkah is about celebrating what is, not about mourning what isn't. And we come to the end of Sukkot, and we arrive at Simchas Torah, the rejoicing in the truth. Our Torah is not simply words on a page. It is the lives we lead. Eitz Chaim He, the Torah is a tree of life. Simchas Torah is when we celebrate the truth of our actual lives, our real imperfect relationships and our real imperfect jobs and our real imperfect homes. The Torah is full of ugly moments and transcendent ones, rapes and betrayals alongside of revelation and redemption. On Simchas Torah, we celebrate the beauty of the truth we find in the Torah and in our lives as well. So here we are on Rosh Hashanah, heading towards the midpoint of this grand arc, which begins on Tisha B'Av with the destruction of dreams, national and personal, mourning those dreams as they wash away. We move through Rosh Hashanah and Tashlich, casting off the stale narratives that we hold on to even though they have long outlived their purpose. We come to Yom Kippur when we are stripped clean of everything, everything that gives life. And from there we move to Sukkot and begin to build something that is simply in this moment without any grand ambitions for the future. We come finally to Simchas Torah where we celebrate the lives we actually live, not the dreams of what was supposed to be. I hope as all of us move through this month's long arc and let go of what needs to be forgotten, we are able to celebrate what needs to be celebrated. That, after all, is what Torah is. It's not words on a page or ink on a scroll. It is a way of life, a tree of life for those who hold fast to it. May we all find what to celebrate in this coming year. Shana Tovah.